Thank you, Ilya. I'm, I'm happy because you kind of made my first slide already. So thank you for that. This is kind of the uh, state of the art for JavaScript mapping libraries in the, uh, in the free open source world. We don't talk about Google Maps here. We don't talk about RGIS JavaScript here. And we don't talk about Mapbox YEL here. But Map Library is kind of the golden child of the map renderers right now because it's really fast performant on vector tiles. The problem is you cannot get away from Web Mercator. That's for me one, one big disadvantage from, from Map Library. There's also open layers, but the onboarding of open layers is kind of clunky and a little bit, so I'm not really happy with it. I tried to do some deep integration with open layers and kind of fail because the internal architecture for me, I, I don't really get it. But that's just me. And then everybody loves Leaflet. Everybody absolutely loves Leaflet because it's so easy to get in. But we have reached in Leaflet a, a performance ceiling a long time ago because there's no WebGL support. And in order to show more than 1,000 points, you need WebGL. That's it. So I have been doing Glio for like four years now with the goals of being easy to get on board. And uh, really, the, the main point here is object-oriented programming extensibility. You have classes, and you have class extensions, and things that really, really look like leaflet plugins. Uh, it's not going to be super optimized for vector tiles. Uh, text support is kind of not working right now. But this is kind of the uh, summary. If you have not seen Glio before, this is how it looks like it looks like on JavaScript. If you have ever used Leaflet, it's like, no, wait, that's Leaflet. No, that's Glio. This is what Glio looks like. It really feels like Leaflet. And there has been a bunch of new features since last year. And uh, the, I'm going to explain all of this with a live demo that you can run on your phones and laptops as well. So I'm going to leave this slide for a couple of seconds so you can copy it, right? People were asking me, are you going to live demo something in your slides? And I said, are you even asking? Come on. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with 20 minutes of live demos in a conference in a computer that's not yours? OK. So before I start with the Glio demos, I'm going to go to the leaflet Glio demos. Uh, oh, I did point to localhost? Oh, God damn it. It failed. Live. Yes. <laughs> so sorry. And then I'm going to leave this up on the screen a couple more seconds. I'm so sorry, folks. I messed it up. Nice. OK, I hope everybody has copied that. <laughs> OK, so uh, this is the first thing I wanted to show. This is not full Glio. This is leaflet. If you look closely here at the bottom, uh, where's the plus sign on this thing here? Oh, this works on the other way. It's actually leaflet. This is actually leaflet with the leaflet zoom controls. But everything that's moving on top, it's like 5,000 uh, points, and that's uh, WebGL Glio. So if you have a leaflet application, and you don't want to get rid of all your entire infrastructure for your leaflet application, you can just load leaflet Glio as a leaflet plugin and start putting stuff on top, which is nice. So the first thing I want to show in, uh, oh, it's a bit too, yep. So you go to the examples here. The first thing I want to show is the symbol group. This is really not exciting. It's just a logical grouping of symbols. So you add symbols to a group, and then you add the group to the map, and then you remove the group from the map, and it works. Not exciting, but it needed to be done. So it's a, it, that's a, one of the new things. Then there's the pointer cursor. It's also not exciting. So you have the normal pointer, the arrow thingy, and when you go on top of the thing, it turns into a hand, and then you take it out, and then it turns to an arrow. So not exciting, but it's kind of needed and not trivial to do in WebGL when you're rendering stuff, especially when you need to make it work with leaflet Glio. So that's it. Something that was made last year um, is the thing about, uh, oh, I don't have it working here. I didn't push last night. So that does that. Uh, next thing is the stroke road. This is one of the fancy ones, which is the line string symbols stroke road. Uh, road rendering is hard, especially when you take into, the, into account the casing. So the usual way to do it is you render the casing, which is the white line, and then you render the main line on top, and then takes two render passes. So this approach is using just one render pass for everything. So in one, in one single symbol with a geometry, you got two different widths, 
and two different colors, so this is rendered all at once. Also, you notice that the crossing of the road looks properly. It looks proper. If you remove one of the symbols, you see the casing goes. So, uh, doing this in one in one single render pass is kind of interesting to to see in the um, in the shaders. Next is the heading triangle. So, if you have features, we have a direction. There's a symbol for that. Not really complicated, but it works. And you can update the heading with JavaScript, like. It's just plain JavaScript to modify the heading. I can change, I can change properties from the symbols, and changing this property with the setter, with this line here, this will go all the deep down, locate the part of the GPU memory where that the value is being held, and redo the whole thing, and it works uh, reliably. Then I spent a hon an awful, awful lot of time on the freaking cluster. So if you have used list load, you know about list load market cluster. This is pretty much the same thing, but for Glio. So it's the same thing. It renders, it has this, uh, it has a function that you can define to define how a cluster is going to show. Uh, it has this fancy animation which spawns the uh, spider thingy when you have points, because the use case I'm, I'm dealing with, the points are not in the same, exact same geographical position, but are slightly apart from each other, so this kind of calls out to each one of the points in the in the cluster, which is nice. This has taken a lot of time. Uh, you have these symbolizer functions, symbolizer functions for the cluster as well. You can customize the, the spider uh, behavior, etc., etc., etc. Then we're going to the Decorators, which is one of the nice things about uh, Glio. Glio is fully object oriented. It does not use style sheets. That means I can, every symbol is a class. So yeah, I have symbol instances and I can decorate the class to change the behavior of, of all symbols of that, of that same kind. This here is one single data set with one single set of geometries and one single set of colors in here, in this line. And it's been drawn two, uh, two times, uh, one offset. And if you notice, one of them is using RGB interpolation, the one at the left is using RGBA interpolation and is creating this kind of muted colors. The one on the right is using HSL color space interpolation. And in order to do that, what I do is just decorate the class. So when I do the new, the new symbol, I use this, oh, well, I use the decorated class. So this is object oriented programming. Not, I don't like style sheets because they don't allow me the necessary flexibility that I want. With this, I can take, again, in the style of the plugins, I can take an, an existing symbol and add more functionality on top of it. In this case, this changes the functionality of how you do color interpolation between vertices or between pixels. Uh, next is the Edgify, which I'm going to show with this one. This is mostly a debug symbol. So you've seen already the, the one where I hover over the uh, big marker here, and it turns into a hand. So this actually shows you the boundary between the pixels that have the normal cursor and the pixels that have the hand cursor. So with this, I can deep, dig down into the internal structure. I can show the internal data for the symbol in a different way to make it obvious to me when I'm debugging. This is mostly a debug, but this shows the capability of doing something different with the internal data. In also, this is also a, a basic edge detection algorithm. If the, uh, if the symbol on the pixel next to me is different, then I render black. That's the algorithm for this. But this has, been, this has helped me locate some errors with the extent of sub-symbols when I'm, when I'm doing uh, weird extrusions of vertices. Next is the text label. Uh, where's the text label? So text labels in Glio were already there. Uh, the interesting thing now is that they are in a web worker. Uh, one of the problems with Glio is that everything runs in the main thread. So vector tile decompression runs in the main thread, which is a performance blocker. It's a bottleneck right now. One of the things I was able to easily uh, put into a different uh, web worker, into a different thread, is text rendering. 
because text, I'm just depending on the browser's 2D rendering capabilities to, to render it. Text is hard. And if you are going to draw like a thousand labels for text, it takes time. It would take a lot of time in the main thread if I would not, de not be doing this. This is mostly internal if you go to sources and text worker. So this is the new functionality. This uh, functionality that runs in this different worker instead of the main thread. So internally, it speeds things up. And I was also be I was able to work in custom typefaces. Because this is rendered on the browser's 2D rendering engine for Canvas, you cannot load these typefaces with CSS. You have to specifically load this with some GLIO functionality here, which is asynchronous. And, and since it's asynchronous, you have to wait for it and do it. But it works, and it works quite reliably. So I'm happy about it. Next is Screen Edgeify. I like this one, because this is the, the one I start showing how this plugin-like thing work. And you will say, hey, you are just doing a uh, decorator. You're decorating the sprites, the, the little markers. And you're creating three of them, and there's nothing special about them, right? Well, you're wrong, because they stick to the edge. The behavior is different. It's not a graphical change in behavior. It's a change on how the coordinates are rendered on the screen. If the, if the coordinate goes out of the minus one, plus one edges of the WebGL rendering thing, I snap the thing, and you can see them all the time. And you can apply this to pretty much any symbol you like, because this is a decorator. This is not a style sheet thing. In the, in the same thing that I can do, the, I, can, I, can, I can do this with circles. I hey, will do this with circles. Or with text labels. Text labels are going to be nicer. I have time for this, right? Boom, it's the same, right? Oh my god, it sticks to the edge. <laughs> so you can do this with any point symbol. It will stick to the edge of the screen when you scroll down. Uh, next is the off-screen indicator. So I'm creating three circles and three off-screen indicators here. And, and they are paired in the coordinates. And what this does is when some of them go out of the screen, you have this fancy little arrow. And it will actually calculate the angle to the point, to the geometry of screen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an application of a previous, of the code for the previous one, plus some new fanciness to calculate the angles. This is something that I want to see on more maps with a very small number of points on them. It's really useful when you're going to a venue and there's some point outside of town, which is the freaking airport every time. I want to a little arrow pointing to it. And when I go to the airport, I want four little arrows pointing to the main places in the main city. So I want to see this in use. Um, next is one of the boring ones that we all need some point or another in life, which is a GeoTIFF loader. I mean, it's a GeoTIFF loader. It loads GeoTIFFs. That's it, if it works, which is not working. So fun, uh, I'm so glad I had the plan B, which is this. <laughs> it looks like this. You just send the URL to the GeoTIFF, and it loads the GeoTIFF in black and white or whatever. I need to work a little bit more on making it uh, render to a scalar field and then making some colors on it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's nice to be able to do this in some non-web Mercator projection. This handles non-web Mercator. If you look closely at the edges of the GeoTIFF, you will see that they are not square. So the, there is a reprojection ongoing in, in underneath here, which is why I'm going to talk next about, uh, no, I was going to talk about Equal Earth, not this one, Equal Earth. So I can, uh, when I define the map here, I can define it with, oh yes, I know, I know this, I know this back. Just do you refresh. So I go to Equal Earth, 
And when I define the map, I say, hey, the CRS of this map is going to be EPSG8857, which is equal Earth. And that happens. And the rest of it is just a raster, the blue marble uh, rectangular raster. And I'm adding some GeoJSON here. The GeoJSON is in that long, in uh, 4326. And it's shown in equal Earth. And it just works transparently. And uh, since I did that, I thought it was a good idea to do automatic projection detection. This is a, a conical Lambert for Europe. And this is being guessed, the, the data, the parameters for this projection are being guessed from the name of the CRS. This makes a request to crsexplorer.project.org that Javier can tell you about more later during the coffee breaks. And it works. I mean, fetches the projection data and reproducts everything. Then, Chains, uh, chains. Lines are hard. If you paid attention to the talk, to the previous previous talk, line rendering is hard. And because it's hard, I made the lazy way of rendering lines, which is I'm going to render separate segments, and I don't care if it looks a bit weird on the joints. I don't have to think about the joints and how they extrude together and everything. I will make them slightly transparent on the ends uh, to, order to minimize the visual effect impact of this. But this is a lazy way of doing things. Why do I want to do the lazy way of doing things? Because the normal way of doing things creates a lot of artifacts. This is a heat chain and a, uh, a heat, uh, heat stroke on the top and a heat chain on the bottom. And this is, uh, if you look at the code here, I'm just generating a, a sequence of points and I'm using the same, I'm using the same points for both geometries of both uh, symbols up and down. The one on the top, which is the normal way of doing strokes, it creates these absolutely horrible, jaggy artifacts, which are really, really, really hard to get rid of when you're doing very close by points in a, in a line string. If you look, straight down to the same sexual of line, this is the same sexual of line with heat strokes. It looks a tiny bit worse on some of the joints, but overall it gets rid of those artifacts. So that's why I want to do this lazy way of rendering things. Then hue shiftify. I am bad on time right now. I'm really bad on time. Uh, it shifts the hue. It turns the thing to, uh, does it load? Yes. You put a number here, which start it is it's, a, it's zero, so it looks like a normal topographical map. You put a different number, and it shifts the hue in the HSL color ramp. That's it. Not very useful, but it has to be done. It's one of the possibilities of, of this, and you can apply it, of course, to more different things. The same thing with the Delune mesh. It's the same thing. I'm, I'm shifting the hue of the points that, uh, that uh, are part of the mesh. Factor scalify. No, not trajectory five, factor scalify. Where's factor scalify? Here. Uh, this is one of the of these that you need for actual cartography. Uh, do you want the same symbol to be very small when you are zoomed out? And as you zoom in, it turns bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Of course, this is exaggerated, but this is something that cartographers want. So it has to be done. Then, circle gauge. Uh, Boring one, I'm out of time. I'm not going to say a lot of it, about it. it's a percentage, it like, like, like a circle with a percentage, that's it. Proto maps loader. Uh, Proto maps, Brandon is not here? Oh yeah, so I don't going to, I'm not gonna talk about proto maps. If you want about to know about proto maps, ask Brandon. He's the man about it. So this, you say the, um, you put a proto maps file on this and you have a symbolizer function and it symbolizes things. Um, because I like protomaps a lot, and Brandon has been fighting with road in uh, highway exchanges. Uh, come on, are you loading? Tell me you're loading. Is this failing again? Don't fail on me again, please. I'm on a live demo. Now it works. So this just renders uh, coastlines and roads, and I'm using my road symbolizer, my, my road stroke symbol. And the highway interchanges, even though I have bumped them out uh, quite a bit, they look kind of nice for a one-pass render of complex interchanges with the joints and the, 
and whatnot. Uh, if you see this example, the symbol as a function is a bit more complicated, and it has this set index for all the segments of rows, so you can change it and play it at home, because I'm kind of bad on time. Then the debug dump. Uh, one of my problems is knowing what the hell is going on under the hood here. So I can click on one of this, because everything is interactive, right? And I can, s I can see the, um, the wireframe representation of this line for debugging purposes. And every time I do this in this particular code, I am getting some information. And I need to uncomment something here. Here. I need to uncomment this. I can also dump all the vertex data for the WebGL data for that symbol, which is really nice when you're fighting some very weird cases that might appear somewhere in where's Manhattan. Uh, are you loading? Come on, load for me. Load for me. Are you loading this one? That's bad. And it's your fault, Brandon. So I can click on it. I can click on it. I can click on this artifact. And I can see where the bad geometry comes from. And I can see all the internal. Uh, this starts from 17. So I can see all the internal vertex data for that specific symbol. Which, for the going purposes, it saves my life and it saves hours of my sanity, and I love it. So, last, I'm going to talk about Monte. I know I'm out of time for by, by one minute. Just bear with me for a second. Monte Carlify. Um, this is based on the Monte Carlo method. I just get one symbol, which is a sprite of a person, and I apply the Monte Carlify decorator, and I turn this into a polygon symbolizer. So I am, this is a polygon geometry, and I'm doing 250 people, which is really nice. I did this on Monday on the hotel because I was uh, annoyed by the official uh, corpleth map for the attendance uh, countries. And this is the kind of you know, spite-driven development. I want to make it better than you. So I made this <laughs> on the hotel room <laughs> two days ago. And then, if you follow uh, social networking and you follow Tony Scardi, he asked me, OK, but can you make them dance? And I said, OK, hold my beer. Boom. So I think that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. And thank you for, to all the people who came from all these countries and are dancing at the rhythm. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> uh, we have a little time for questions. How many people are represented on this map? All, all of us. Yeah, one, one person to one person. This is this has a one person to one person ratio. I don't know what's going on in the Netherlands. There's lots of people from the Netherlands for no reason. You mentioned that. Uh, uh, it's not really ready for vector tiles. Wh why is that? Um, I am not aiming for vector tile performance. I am aiming for flexibility. That's the thing. I could, I could, uh, right now, I could take this symbol, go into some protobuf, uh, some protomaps vector tiles, and apply this. Hell, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take this. Let me copy paste. Let me copy paste the code real quick. I may mean for flexibility. That's my thing. I want flexible, fast development on the JavaScript side of things. I don't want to go crazy with ultra optimizing the WebGL things and byte packing stuff. I want to be flexible. So I can go into the Monte Carlify and get this thing.
find. This is the problem with live demos on the questions part of the talk. And then I want 50. And now I have people all over the seas. Now I have people all around with two minutes of development. I, I'm changing the symbolizer for, a poly, for the polygons of vertex tiles all over, and I'm applying a custom thing. So this is what I am aiming for. I'm aiming for flexibility, not full-on performance. That's my goal. OK, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you, Ivan. You can find me Thank everywhere. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.